If I'm on my game this morning, um, it's not anything that I've done, but I've taken on an alter ego, so to speak. Uh, You've heard of the Terminator. Well, this morning, I want to show you that I am the Sermonator. So, this is courtesy of Jim Van, so thanks for that. So, kind of feeling all frisky, so I'm good. I'm ready to go. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So God created, God formed, God rendered. God here in in the original Hebrew text is a common word, Elohim. It's plural, paired with a singular verb. So a plurality singularly created. The plurality of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We see here God the Father and God the Spirit mentioned here in the first two verses. And we know from from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, that God the Son was there as well. All coming together for a single task, the creation of the world and everything in it. So from the word go, the Trinity was present. And it's sometimes referred to throughout Scripture as the heavenly council. And there it was, at the heart of everything. This is 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and all over the earth and over all the creation. Move along the ground. This is the first chapter in the first book lays out the theology of the triune God. And, and generally, when you bring up the word Trinity, uh, it, it elicits one of two reactions. The, the first is, well, the, the Trinity is not even mentioned in Scripture. And, and that's true. But each of the parts, the three members that, that make up this body are distinct. It's important that we understand how they interact with one another. The, but the second reaction is snoozer. It's like, Okay, if we're talking about the Trinity, honey, wake me up when it's time to start singing. But in reality, we're not getting off in the doctrinal weeds of the triune God. In reality, we're talking about the image that we're created in of Elohim, the Father, Son, the Spirit. And we will continue to struggle in our relationships as a church. And we'll continue to struggle with our relationships with our spouse and with our friends and with our fellow students and with our co-workers and our neighbors and our friends, until we understand this relationship and this interaction that takes place within the Trinity. So it's important for us to understand this, that we'll never figure out this life in community until we understand the community that's been there for all of time. And if, if that doesn't interest you to, to stay awake for a few minutes, perhaps consider this a crash course for when the Jehovah's Witness come and knock at your door. You'll you'll be ready to go and know and to say, can you come back later? Okay? You'll be ready. Deuteronomy 6, in verses 4 and 5, is described or called as the Shema, that that the the Jews prayed in the morning and at evening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God. The Lord your God. Yahweh is Elohim. Well, I've, I've heard the, the Trinity described by a lot of people as like H2O. And maybe, maybe you've seen this, that uh, in, in its liquid form, it's water. And in its solid form, well, of course, it's ice. And then in its gas form, well, it, it's a vapor. But I don't really like this description of this because in, in reality, if we look at that way, it's modalism in that God morphs into various modes according to needs or according to the environment in which he's entering. The, the better way to look at it is, is like a cluster of grapes where you've got these individual parts that come together to form one united cluster. So you have the one true God, this one in essence, three in person, distinct in their roles. So if, if you look at this, uh, the Father is, is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. 
But yet the Father is God, the Spirit is God, and the Son is God. One united God at the same time. Last year at the Right Now conference, a guy named Todd Wagner, who's the uh, preacher for the Watermark Community Church, illustrated the Trinity by using some chairs. And so I wanted to give him credit, but I thought it was a great idea. But what Todd ended up coming up with, he says, that if, if you look at the idea of, of God the Father, then you have God the Son, and you have God the Spirit, they all eternally dwell together in character and in form as one. And so if, if you look at this idea that they've all been together for all of eternity, and, and what is the description of this relationship? Well, if, if you think about it, as they come together and how they interact with one another, they have mutual exaltation. They have mutual love for each other, mutual care for each other, and they form a mutual community. And so they have, it's described as being a selfless union between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And they're mutually submitting to one another. So this is the core of who we are as a people. This is who we were created in the image of. And if you think about it, it's not just this group. But as they come together, it's a group that's without blemish, without sin, and without darkness. But also included in here is us. Because the object of this love becomes us as people. And so God says, everything that we have among us, we want to share with you. You're the object of this love. And for us, in order for us to respond to the love that has been given to us, we also were created in a way that we're, we don't have to respond. We don't have to love. We, we can hate in return. And we don't have to display righteousness. We can also be unrighteous or wicked. So God knowing this, explain to Adam and to Eve and, and to us as well that I love and, and care for you and all this that I've created, I've created for you. And as a father, we understand giving good gifts to our children and he says, how much more as your heavenly father will I give to you? I'll provide everything that you need. It, it's all here. You will not lack for anything. This is what you should create. This is what you should crave to want to be a part of because you were born into our image and shaped to be in this type of community. Guess who else is here? The deceiver. And the deceiver talks into our ears and says, what you're experiencing here is not enough. You're not getting the whole story here. There's more to it than what God the Father is trying to describe here. And you're going to be missing out if, if you kind of buy into this whole way of thinking. And so the deceiver, the, the liar, does everything he can to seduce our hearts away. And we, like Adam, have been, left to, have been led astray. If you think about it, for the first time within this community, we now have betrayal. We now have sin. And we now have darkness. And, and, and the Father says, there's really nothing else I can do but do what I said I would do, which was cast man out into the darkness. So no longer was he allowed to be a part of this union. Praise be the Lord that this is not how the story ends. Because see, God understood that this was going to happen. He, he knew that when presented with this choice that Satan would present an argument and, and present something to be way too enticing that would lead man astray. So a lot of people ask, well, if God knew this was going to happen, why would he create us in the first place? Did he just set himself up to be d disappointed? It's very visible in creation. Everything around us that God is a powerful God. By creating us, it also shows he's a loving God. And so God is going to use this deception and this being led off into uh, to darkness and destruction. He's going to allow that to demonstrate his loving heart. He's also going to bring glory to his name with his plan. So what was his plan? 
before time began and all this took place, everyone knew what was going to happen. And so he tells the son, your time is here. And though you're part of our nature, and I'm in you, and you're in me, and we're in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in us, and we have this equal union among us. You are the visible representation of us. And we're going to ask you to humble yourself and to be made in the image and to come and be a part of humanity. To humble yourself, to become a servant, to be one of them. And to do that, you're going to have to trust my plan. And you're going to have to yield to the Spirit. And you're going to have to set aside your glory for a time so that they can be brought back brought back into this union. And and the son says, I'll do that. And so the son comes from a very humble beginning, born in a manger, lived as a, a, a pauper, as a carpenter's son. But he began to live among us and began talking about the kingdom. Whose kingdom was he talking about? He's talking about the kingdom of his father. And he's trying to give us glimpse. He's trying to give us insight This is the world in which I've come. And this is the world I'm trying to usher in. And it's not going to be made perfect until I return a second time. But in the meantime, let me give you a glimpse of where all this is going. Let me me tell you a little bit about my father's world and this kingdom. Let me demonstrate by those that are lame starting to walk. Those that are blind being able to see. And those that have been captivated by Satan to be released. These are the things. The dead coming back to life. It's all part, and it's also besides they're pointing us to a reconciliation that God wants to take place. And so he's talking and demonstrating love and forgiveness for those that have been outcast by others. And yet in all of this, he's rejected. But he knows that that's part of the plan. And so he willingly starts heading towards Jerusalem knowing that he's going to be rejected and knowing that he'll be sacrificed. And as Clark talked about, at this very moment, he agreed to be the sacrificial lamb and to take on our sins. As Clark mentioned, for the very first time, suddenly, God the Father and God the Spirit could not be in the presence of God the Son because of their holiness in the sin that he's taken upon himself. And at this very moment when the separation takes place, the first time in in all of eternity that there's been this separation within the Trinity, he cries out, "My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this had to be incredibly difficult, not only to to feel the pain, but the pain of the separation and and to no longer be in this loving community that's the basis of everything. Everything. Yet after the debt had been paid and the curse had been lifted, the Lord says it's time. And the Spirit of God came and brought Jesus back from the dead. And God the Father exalted the Son at the ascension, brought him back to his right hand. And so this community was restored. And this thing that brings meaning and life and image to everything that's supposed to be in this world and the world to come has now been restored. But not only Jesus welcomed back, but we're welcomed back into the mix as well. Praise be the Lord. And so as we come in, we realize we're a selfish people, but because of their selflessness, we're we're invited to come back in. And so we say, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And thank you for the power that brings about true change. And and I know if I understand this, that you guys are a holy and blessed people and uh, just this incredible being, it's going to change me. And so I can start learning to love for the first time. I can learn how to care from being with you. And hopefully through this community, I can become a little less selfish, become a little more selfless. And hopefully I can can learn to submit my will for your will and your promptings to change my life. 
I just want to be with you guys forever. <laughs> Group hug. <laughs> this is wonderful. And God the Father says, Brad, that, that's right. Your love, you're accepted as you are. And, and that love is incredible. We want you to be a part of this fellowship. But we want you to invite someone else into this fellowship. And my first reaction is, why? Things are going great. Can't we just kind of keep this thing going? He goes, no, go find someone else. So my first thought is, I know who I'm going to grab. I'm no dummy. I'm going to get my wife because she's awesome. And I introduced her to the group. And like, well, yeah, we, we, we know, you know, and so she gets invited into this and things are going pretty well. And suddenly I'm in the presence of God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit and my favorite person in the whole wide world, my best friend Jill. And things are, are clicking along for a while, but then they don't. See, the, the problem is, unlike me, God's not done with Jill. She's still got some work that needs to take place. Oh, she's been forgiven by Jesus. All, all of her sins have been taken away. But some of her is still in need of some improvement. Hadn't quite been all eradicated. And, and over a period of time, I started thinking, maybe this group of five isn't working as well as it should be. So, honey, look over there. Is it just me? Or is she bugging the tar out of you like she's bugging the tar out of me? We've got to do something about this because things were wonderful when it was just the four of us. And, you know, when I would say something to you, you knew exactly what I was talking about. When I said something to her, she's like, what do you mean by that? I didn't mean anything by it. Well, you, 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 you don't use that tone with me. And I'm like, what is going on? I didn't have to have any accountability for my time, stay as long as I want, spent my money, did whatever I, I pleased. It was just the four of us. And the four of us was wonderful. And you know what? Five is just too much. Let's get this back to it. All right. It's the bros. We're doing good. Okay? And so we've got the Father, Son, and, and, and everything is the way it's supposed to be, and it works for me. God lets me know that some of the things I feel she's done to me that I've done to him. And, and, and some of the offenses that, that I claim, well, my offenses to God are so much more. He mentioned something about a log. I don't know what he's talking about. Okay, well, it, it may be there, but she's still got a speck, and even though it's little, it, it's big. Have you ever had a little pebble in your shoe or your sandal? Yeah, it, it, it's terrible. It, it just starts irritating everything. You want me to go get her back? Are you sure? Okay. All right. Honey, listen, I'm, I'm sorry. This wasn't your fault. It was mine. It, was, I, it wasn't about you. Lately, I've been kind of self-centered and uh, I know I pushed you away, but I want to welcome you back into this fellowship. So after a period of time and growth and maturity, God starts knitting our relationship in a different way to where our marriage is marked by mutual exaltation, love and, and care that's different than what's seen out in the world. And we have a community that's different because it's based on this community that has changed us. And our selfishness is changed for selflessness. We learn to submit one to another. And this begins working. And, and, and God says, it's not enough what you have here. You've got to go get more. And I'm like, God, I'm not sure this is a good idea, but I'll do this i got to warn you, every time that you add more people into the mix, more people have their own ideas and are selfish and self-centered and everything else, it's going to bring about problems. It's going to bring about friction. So you've got to get ready for this because you know what's going to happen. And Jesus says, 
Yes, but I died for them as well. And God says, they're my children and I love them like I love you. And the Spirit says, I've begun to work in them like I've begun to work in you. You've all got to come together. Well, there's kind of a, a, a trendy thing that's going on right now is permeating the churches. And that's, if I'm going to have a relationship with God, this is what I want. I want it to be me and Jesus. You know, if you do the whole, my God and I walk through the fields, forget the other two. I, I want Jesus because he seems to be the more loving of the three and, and he's willing to die for me and he seems sweet. And so if I have any problems, I'll just have a little talk with Jesus and everything's going to be fine. And so we think that this is kind of a new enlightened approach where you can do this relationship with Jesus apart from the problems that happen when you bring people together in community. It's a lot easier. And a lot of people think this is enlightened. And that it shows real maturity if you can say, you know what, I just want to get back just me and Jesus. But in reality, when we craft a religious world that just meets our needs, that's a sign of immaturity instead of maturity. What's, what's difficult is when we come back to become part of a community. We know that we're going to do the difficult tasks of working with brothers and sisters and, and, and putting ourselves on a leadership that, that maybe we don't always a, agree with. And, and caring for people that we, quite frankly, don't care for. And trying to get on the same page with people we don't see eye to eye. Why is this important that we do this? This necessary, difficult part of figuring out community and basing it upon this relationship. Here's why. What else is going on out in the world? There's a group of people, it's a small majority, a small group of people in the world that say there is no God. And there's others that aren't sure. And they're saying, oh, I, I don't know. And, and I haven't really experienced that in my life. I, I'm not sure. I, I think there's something good, but I haven't really found it myself. And so what do they see? They see this group. People that have God. And if we're a fragmented group that isn't getting along with one another, it isn't quite working together, then it just confirms their suspicion that, okay, if there is a God, He's not involved with the people that said that they are. But if people see us sit knee to knee, arm in arm, and you start looking how this group is interacting, a group that has mutual exaltation, mutual love and care for one another, a, a community that can't be found out in any other venue, and they're submitting to one another's needs, that's exciting. And they say, perhaps there is something to this thing based on what I see here, based on the love they have for one another. And so the more that we pay attention to Jesus' teachings, and not only the way that he valued truth, but the way that he valued love and grace, and we say, I just want to treat people like I see Jesus treating people. And, and the more that we say, you know what, God's ways appear to be better than, than man's ways. And though sometimes that's going to be a little awkward, and I, I'm going to go with the, the truth of God every time. And the more that we see a people that are listening to the promptings of the Spirit and allowing Him to take over their body, and, and, and really we start dismissing the impulses that come from us that cause us to sin and cause selfishness and say we want to be other-centered than what the Spirit is prompting us to do to love and serve. That's when things start getting exciting. And that's when people say, there might be something to this group. There might be authentic community. Well, what else can we do to bolster that the Trinity is among us? That the same type of relationship is indeed permeating who we are as a community? Well, Paul lays out in the one another passages 
it's just incredible. You start looking at this. We accept one another. We agree with one another. We're accountable to one another. We're compassionate to one another. We're devoted and humble towards one another. We're kind and patient and at peace with one another. It's not easy, but we strive. We strive to be as the same mind as one another. We carry each other's burdens in a world that is very difficult. We, we confess and we encourage and we forgive one another. We greet and we help and we do our best to live in harmony with one another. We love and we serve and we strengthen one another and we submit to one another and we spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And when we selfishly start doing these things, we selflessly start doing these things, we become a living testimony to Elohim, to this God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. He is truly among us, and He has this something that's creating in us. Now, it's not going to be easy. It doesn't happen overnight. But when we see this played out, we know it's possible. We know it's possible. But if, if these things are not present, it really doesn't matter if we have a cool website. It doesn't matter that we redid our auditorium. It, it doesn't matter if, if Mike and Mike put all the time into creating this awesome podcast, or, or even that we have a children's ministry or, or youth ministry, or we do work out in the community. It all comes up flat if people are not experiencing God-centered community among us. But when this thing takes hold, when we start looking to the needs of others, suddenly as we start looking a little first century, amen? And people say, I want to be a part of that. Why? Not just us. Everyone is created in the image of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. In that relationship, we crave to be a part of authentic community. Where do we start? How do we kind of get our, our, ourselves going on this? What are some tangible things we can do? I just want to encourage you. These are just a few suggestions. But think of ways for you to get outside yourself and to be others-centered. Maybe next Sunday, if you're one of the first people to drive up, up in the parking lot, instead of taking the great spots, park as far out as possible. So it communicates to those that they're coming in a little bit late, we're expecting you. We want you here. Take the better spots. We walk into the worship center. It, these are long aisles. It's hard climbing over when you're five minutes late anyway, climbing over three families. Scoot towards the middle. Maybe if, if you're here early, you don't wait for Lincoln or whoever to do the meet and greet. You just say, introduce yourself to people left and right behind you, in front of you. And perhaps after service, invite one of them to go out to eat with you. Invite them into your group, as, as was talked about earlier with Barry. Invite them to be a part of your community. Invite them to be part of the community based on this. When, when you go to small group next Sunday night, Prepare your signature dish as almost an act of, of worship and, and say, I value this community to give it my best, and I want to do that. On Wednesday, when the Barnabas list comes out, spend a moment praying over each person on that list. May, maybe write a card to them, letting them know that they're, they're being prayed for and they're valuable. And we start allowing this to permeate our campus, then we take it to the world. We start becoming other-centered at school. So you guys walk into a cafeteria and there, there's a new student that's come in. Invite them over to your table or go sit with them. You're constantly looking for ways to serve others instead of, what, 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 what are my needs? You're looking for other people. In, in, in your board meetings and, and other times, value other people's opinion. Do your best to build consensus. Uh, Maybe bring your assistant their favorite Starbucks drink. Roll out a trash can back to the cranky neighbor that no one on the street likes. Do anything you can to build community, to show people it's not about you, but you're building community with others. You know, it's not much, but it's a start. But it gets our mindset focused on others. And the more we become like Christ, the more it begins to permeate. The more we die to ourselves, and we say, Spirit, lead us. The more that we say, 
Father, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus, captivate our heart. That's when you start seeing change. That's when authentic community is built and people will respond. My prayer for us today is may we selfishly reflect our one true God.